If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 15 here in just a minute. But today's sermon title is Paul Reaches Jerusalem. Paul Reaches Jerusalem. Uh, You know, the estimates of how long he had been gone this time vary from anywhere from three three to four years. And so, you know, he was so excited about getting back to Jerusalem and seeing the church there at Jerusalem and how it had grown and all that had gone on. Gone on. And uh, you have to realize that, uh, you know, uh, home churches are, are a wonderful thing. You know, my home and, and where I was born and raised is Lawton, Oklahoma, and I'll, I'll always, it'll always be special to me. I have two sisters that still live there. I have uh, cousins and different folks uh, also. And Paul was, you know, I know looking forward to going home. And uh, he did reach it by the day of Pentecost, uh, uh, which we will see in our text today. Uh, so we want to look at Paul reaching Jerusalem. And let me give you the outline. Uh, number one, Paul's communion with the church. Paul's communion with the church. All right, and of course, the day of Pentecost, we know about that. Uh, but there is a good chance that they broke bread and, and communed together. Number two, the church's confusion about Paul. The, per, the church's confusion about Paul. Folks, we know where confusion comes from. Folks, it's the devil, all right? He is the author of confusion. Number three, Paul and the church's compromise. Paul and the church's compromise. And we're not talking about compromising doctrinally okay we are not changing our doctrine we will go by the word of god and if somebody doesn't like that they are just going to have to get over it okay Uh, we are going to preach the word of god that's the way it is uh you know there's not going to be any censoring here you know uh you know we have our first amendments right just like everybody else and we are going to preach the word Uh, but you will see here uh the purpose of what was going on and uh, I'm going to give you my opinion of what went on too, uh, for whatever it's worth. All right, you know this is the end of uh, Paul's third missionary journey. Uh, the Book of Acts reveals many aspects about Paul's character. He was a powerful preacher, a man of great learning, and was full of wisdom from God. Paul was bold and fearless in the face of adversity. He was self-disciplined and totally committed to our Lord and Savior. He was a true leader who inspired others to live for Christ. Paul was also a humble Christian. He could have boasted in all that he had done in in these missionary journeys, but he refused to go there. Paul spearheaded the spread of the gospel and established many churches throughout the Roman world. He truly became the apostle to the Gentiles that that had a godly determination to get the work of the Lord done, regardless of the distractions, defections, and discouragements. His love for the church was seen in the collection of an offering for the Jewish believers that were being persecuted by Judaizers and the legalists in Jerusalem. Paul finally made it to the church in Jerusalem, but there was a surprise waiting for him there. Let's look at this interesting text of Paul arriving in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 21, starting in verse 15, Paul's communion with the church. And after those days, and we talked last week how he was traveling, and a lot of it was just travel log. But three times people told him and warned him not to go to Jerusalem. But I believe he was following the Holy Spirit and doing what the Lord wanted him to to do. And it says, we packed and we went to Jerusalem. It was 65 miles away. You know, whether they were riding donkeys or or walking, it would be somewhere between a two and a four day trip. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us. And what he did as he collected these, uh, this special offering for the church in Jerusalem, uh, he would pick out leaders in the churches And he would ask them to go also and to testify and to give witness of what Paul was saying. There was two reasons for that. One is, you know, so they could rejoice with what was going on in their church, but to see eyewitnesses of what was going on in people's churches. 
So you, you see the strategy of Paul was using there. And brought them a certain, uh, certain mason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. For so, some reason, Mason had went to Caesarea and he met up with Paul and maybe he found out that he was coming and just wanted to meet him there. And when it talks here about early, uh, you know, early, this was an older gentleman. There's not a lot of information about him, uh, but there was an indication that he could have been saved on the day of Pentecost. So you're talking some 20 years before, all right, this had happened and all that was going on there. And if you notice his names, it is a Greek name, and he was a Gentile. So I thought that was interesting. Folks, I don't believe anything happens uh, by accident or happenstance. God div divinely directs us in everything we do if we will listen, if we will obey. In verse 17, and when he had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And folks, you, you know how those... Uh, reunions are when you haven't seen somebody for three or four years and you had heard bits and pieces of what was going on in Paul's ministry and the the hundreds of people that were saved and uh, the persecutions and all the other things that he had went through just to see him alive he had prob they'd have probably heard he was thrown in prison they had probably heard he was beaten and left for dead. They had probably heard some of these things that had went on in these missionary journeys. But he persevered. He pushed through. He, he was a man of determination. He wasn't going to quit till he got back to Jerusalem. Then verse 18, On the following day, he went with us, us to James and all the elders who were present. And again, James was the pastor of the church there. And they, uh, the first day, uh, they, they had met and they just had what I call a light fellowship. All right? They were just talking and praising God and, and just, you know, just you know, the greeting and, and just meeting one another and just being happy after they hadn't seen him for so long. And so the second day, they go to the leaders of the church at Jerusalem. And when he had greeted them, he told them in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when it says in detail, you have to realize their church services probably weren't like ours. Okay, we have specific time slots. All right, we meet at 10 o'clock or 1030, and when it gets to about 1130, we think we need to go. All right, now I'm not promoting preaching 45 minutes, all right? That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying, when you are in revival, when something great is happening, you do not care what time it is. I said in a service for J. Harold Smith for two and a half hours, we baptized 72, no, no, we had 72 professions of faith that day, and 12 of them got baptized on the spot. And nobody was complaining about that. And I'm not complaining to you. I'm simply trying to get you to understand their timetable is not like our timetable. All right? Folks, when the Holy Spirit moves, you know what we really need to do? We need to take our watches off and just put them in our pockets. Because I'd rather see what God does than worry about a roast that is burnt at my house. Okay? There are dollar menus everywhere. All right? The second part. And when they heard it, they glorified God. Folks, that is so important. They weren't glorifying Paul. They weren't telling Paul what a great job he had done, even though our, our man side, our, our human side wants to hear that. They were praising God to hear that these Gentiles were being saved. That these churches were were being, uh, you know, uh, bloomed and, and blossoming. That these new Christians were being discipled. And that leaders were, were being raised up. And Paul would stay at those churches till he felt like there was a leader there that would go. So they just had a praise and worship time that went on, for, I'm, I'm guessing, for a long time. Now, hold your finger there and go to 2 Corinthians 10 with me. 2 Corinthians 10. The Apostle Paul is writing here, 2 Corinthians 10. 
And we're going to start in verse 12. And here's basically what he's saying. We have no reason to brag about anything. If it wasn't for God, nothing would happen, folks. We sow, we plant, we water, we even reap. But the Bible says God gives the increase. So Paul could have boasted on what he had done in these years that he was gone. But he did not. He simply told and testified what God did. And folks, human pride, it's in us all. If you say you have no pride, whew, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about that. We all have some form of human pride. And folks, we have to keep that down. We have to beat that pride down. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. All right? We shouldn't have to compliment ourselves, okay? We shouldn't have to throw hints around for compliments. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Folks, it's easy to do. You, For instance, if you're looking to be spiritual, you know what you do? You talk about somebody that is not spiritual. Why? Because they make you look better. You think, well, I ain't like old and you just fill in the blank. That should not even be a topic of your discussion, folks. We only please God. My job here, as much as I want to make everybody happy, I'm pretty sure that is not possible. It's just not. Even with my good personality, all right? I, I don't understand that. Folks, I'm serious here. We're not always going to agree. We're not always. But folks, don't pick out other people's faults. That's what he's saying. Let God take care of that, all right? When in doubt, do without. When in doubt, be quiet. Don't say it. If someone comes up to you and says, I probably shouldn't tell you this, Stop them. Here's the deal. Well, don't. Well, just don't. Now, they'll go like this. But just don't. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us. God will praise you if you need praising. God takes care of us. A sphere which is especially includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you, and we came with the gospel of Christ. And folks, people put even pastors on pedestals. Folks, this week in the news, right here in Fort Smith, it broke my heart to hear what happened. And we shouldn't spread that. We shouldn't spread that. We should pray for this family and pray for this church if it wasn't for the grace of God. Folks, we should not do that. Verse 15, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be uh, greatly enlarged uh, by you in your sphere. Folks, sometimes we get caught in that numbers thing. How many did you have in church? How many baptisms did you have this week? How many? And I understand, a guy told me once, hey, they wrote a book on numbers. I'm not against that. But folks, we shouldn't compare to other churches. I'm telling you, I believe the man that is in rural Arkansas, southeastern, running 25 in Sunday school, and has been at that church for 25 years, is just as important as those who are on TV today. God acknowledges that. We shall be greatly enlarged to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's fear of accomplishments. But here it is. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Folks, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about God. It's about praising Him. If we want to boast, we need to boast in the Lord. Can I tell you what Jesus has done for me? Can I tell you how God answered a prayer request of mine? Can I tell you how God come through? At the last second, folks, we need to do a whole lot more boasting about Jesus Christ. Amen, right. For not He who commends Himself is approved, but whom the Lord 
commends. My friends, it is God who saves. It is God who saves. It is God who heals. It is God who answers our prayers. It is God that gives us the next breath we breathe. It is God whom we need to give glory to every day of our lives. So much communion, much praise, much uh, testimonies, uh, everything that was going on. Paul probably took the whole day to tell about. Then the second thing I want you to see, not only Paul's communion with the church, but the church's confusion about Paul. And you know, there's a word I want to associate with confusion. Concern. Sometimes people walk up to you, I have great concern for you. Really? Tell me about it. Okay? And folks, we can spiritualize a lot of things, okay? We can spiritualize, but instead of spiritualizing, folks, we need to pray, 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 pray for others. Pray for ministries. Pray for churches. Pray that people get saved. Pray. Now look at the second part of verse 20. And they said to him, you see, brother, that should tell you something. All right? You see, brother, you know, going on? All right? How many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous of the law. And here's the word in verse 22. But, okay, it's one of those deals before you get chewed out. You're doing a great job, but... All right, anybody been there? Folks, we've all been there. Okay? He was on a high. He was on a high. All these things were going on. All right? But you know something I realized? To get to the highs, you got to come through the lows. Okay? I wished praising God and serving God and everything, I, I wish we could just stay on the mountaintop. I wish we could just stay there 24-7. But folks, somewhere reality has to kick in. All right, but they have been informed about you that you uh, teach with all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children nor walk according to their customs. So, the first thing that stuck out in my mind here myriad of Jews. You know what myriad is? It's like myriad of angels. There are thousands of people in Jerusalem talking about you, there are a thousand people think. You aren't a Jew anymore. There are a thousand people that think you are against the Old Testament and the Word of God. There are, there, are, there are a big group that thinks and really question you've been in the Gentile world so long that maybe you've become like them. That's what it really is saying. Because look at the rest of that. The assembly, what? What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. So what is he saying? What is James saying? We got a problem. We got a problem. And I know if Paul, and again, I, I don't compare myself to him. I, I hope someday I could be somewhere in his uh, you know, zip code somewhere. All right? But, but the they, my question is always this, who's they? Anybody figured that out yet? Who is they? All right, well, I, I can't say. I just really can't say. And again, folks, it's just like, you know, you're, you're rocking along and things are going good. And here's the deal. Anybody doing something with, for God is going to get criticized. It's going to happen, folks. I honestly heard a pastor, pastor friend of mine, he was in another state, he was in a small church, and people were getting saved. And then they started baptizing people. And they had a deacon's meeting. And do you know what was said in this deacon's meeting? These are not our kind of people. Really? Folks, my heart broke. This guy was his second pastorate. He had left his home. He had left his family and was serving in rural North Carolina. And yet, these are not our people. They're not like us. Well, excuse me. I think we all have a head. I think we all got hands. Does it really matter the color of our skin? We all bleed red. 
Folks, I'm telling you, this is wrong. They were accusing Paul of something he did not do. How do you know that? I'll tell you why. Because number one, what, remember what he did to Timothy? He said, Timothy, if you're going to hang out with me, you're going to have to get circumcised. Now, folks, I don't know that that's on the job application, but Timothy as a grown man would have to think, oh, I don't know about that. But you know, he did it. Timothy did it. He later, earlier, did a Nazarene vow. Okay? And here's what I'm saying. I'm just saying, you know, when they line these folks up and the elders come and all this is going on, folks, I, I just don't think it's fair to Paul. Why does Paul have to explain himself where he nearly died for the cause of Christ. And here's the deal. Folks, I don't believe it would have changed anything. Because I know the rest of the story. Okay? He was arrested anyway. Alright? So folks, you, you have to realize how much danger rumors are in a church. Rumors will divide a church. Rumors will squelch the Holy Spirit in a church. Rumors, uh, folks, you, you just, why, why can't you do what the Bible says and just go straight to the source? Go straight, to, that's what Matthew 18 says. And folks, I'm not, I'm not saying anything like that is going on here, but I've seen it my whole life. I've seen it my whole life where, where pastors have to, uh, you know, get up and move their whole family and move everybody because of rumors. And the Bible speaks of this, all right? Uh, Proverbs 6, go with me. Proverbs 6, go with me to Proverbs 6. Verse 16. Proverbs 6, 16. These six things the Lord hates. Oh, I thought we wasn't supposed to hate. Hey, you aren't supposed to hate. All right? You aren't. But you should, like God, hate sin. We need to hate sin. We love the sinner, but we hate sin. I'm telling you right now, I hate the devil. I hate him. I hate what he does in life of our members. He lies to you. He tells you right is wrong and wrong is right. He sneaks around. All right? I hate the devil. Yes, seven are an abomination unto him. Whoa, that's a, that's a heavy word there, folks. First we go with hate. Abomination is, I can't believe you would do that. I can't believe it. 17, a proud look. God hates a proud look. Folks, the Bible clearly says we all should be humble. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. A lying tongue. How can I believe you the second time if you lied to me the first time? Folks, tell the truth. Even if it gets you in trouble, tell the truth. Hands that shed innocent blood. I'm telling you, the judgment of God is on America because we've been aborting children and babies for years and years and years. And we are simply reaping what we have sowed. A heart that devises wicked plans. Okay, he's not looking out for the best of you. Hey folks, just because somebody says, I'm looking out for you, that may not be the truth. Feet that are swift to run to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And here's the one, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Folks, I'm telling you, we need to tell the truth, but we also need to tell the truth in love, is what First Peter says. Check your facts out. Well, I read on the internet the other day. Well, I read Facebook. and Check it out, folks. Check it out. Paul, I believe, was attacked unjustly. I don't think it should have happened. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each other's well-being. Folks, we need to respect others' beliefs. All right, Paul was not telling the Jews that they could not be Jews. He was not telling the Hebrews, hey, you have to forsake that. If they associated that with salvation, then Paul had a problem with it. But they settled all that at the Jerusalem Council. You remember where we talked about that? 
the Jerusalem council, yeah, you can still do some of these things, but some you can't. Eat whatsoever is sold in the meat market. Ask no questions for conscience sake. All right? And folks, that's, that's the deal now. People you know, want to say, okay, you eat pork chops? You eat bacon? I sure do. All right? I sure do. Why? Because Peter in Cornelius' house, who was a Gentile, God said all this meat and all these beasts there, and he just said, what I clean is clean. You have to understand, too, the, the processing of meat back then was just, ugh. I mean, you probably would not eat some of the stuff that was set on the table. When you look up and you see an eyeball there, you probably are going to have a problem with that. All right? All right? But here's the deal. We need to respect one another. For instance, if I know a person doesn't eat pork and I invite them to my house, I don't need to serve pork, folks. Just common sense. Okay? But if somebody wants to eat pork, let them eat pork. You chew on whatever. If you want to, you know, munch on salad and herbs and do it. That's good. You'll lose weight and you'll be healthier. Okay? If any of those, uh, I got somebody tickled over there. <laughs> if any of those of you who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go eat, eat whatever set before you, asking no questions for conscience' sake. Don't call them up beforehand and say, "What are we going to have?" Ooh, ooh, no, you got to change the menu, all right? You ought to just thank God, one, that they invited you, two, that they were going to feed you. You can find something to eat on the table. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you. For consciousness sake, the earth is the Lord in its fullness. There are people that have that. There are people that don't think you ought to. There's vegetarians. Folks, I tried it for four months, vegetarian, and you know what I decided? I would rather die. <laughs> I'm serious. I was so hungry all the time, and I would walk by a hamburger stand, and I'm just like, oh man. And I was doing it for discipline purposes, but it was the hardest three months of my life, folks. But don't mess with those that do. Conscious, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the foods over which I give thanks? Folks, I am not going to not have fellowship with somebody because of what they eat or what they do or, or drink or, 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 or that. Verse 31 is the key, folks. Therefore, whether you eat or whether you do, here it is, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Folks, my life verse in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, avoid all appearances of evil. When in doubt, I do without. But I am not going to judge another man. I'm not going to judge another woman by what they eat or what they have on or the color of their skin and how many piercings they have or how many tattoos they have. I, w I refuse to judge people on the outward appearance. Why? Because God looks on the heart. So we see the confusion, the so-called concern. These Judaizers were just spreading lies and rumors about Paul. And folks, I'm telling you, many people have left our churches because we have judged them the minute they've walked in to our doors. And it should not be. Number three. And Paul and the churches compromise. Back in our text, Paul and the churches compromise. Acts chapter 21, verse 23. Wherefore, do what we tell you. <laughs> we can all get along. Why? Do what I tell you. I I'm just telling you folks, I think you're understanding where I'm coming from. All right? That's how I know I'm not where Paul was. Okay? Because these phrases just... It's just like, they just go all over me, okay? Won't my track record be enough? Won't my preaching be enough? Won't my soul winning be enough? If you'll do what I t we tell you, we have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them. Pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that we may all know that those things in which you were informed concerning are nothing, but that you give yourself 
also and walk orderly and keep the law. So take these four minutes with you. Well, folks, we know the Nazarene uh, uh, valve was 30 days. So there's already, you know, 24 days that had went by or 20, 23 days that had went by. So one thing, they were asking him to go right into the middle of the vow because these folks have already done it and they've already started it. But as an expression, as just showing, okay? Then the second thing is, he said, you need to pay for these four guys. Folks, one of these, you had to pay for the haircut. You had to pay for the animal sacrifices. There was a lot of expense there. All right? My question is, why didn't the church pay for it? I mean, if they want to pay for it, why did Paul have to pay for it? I do not understand that. All right? And the whole deal is he's already done what he, they are asking him to do. And that's why I say... I understand compromise, and I'm not saying Paul did the wrong thing. Paul did the right thing for him. For him. Paul chose to do this. But when put people put pressure on me, and put pressure, and folks, uh, what they have is these subtle hints. These subtle hints that are almost a threat. And then they say, well, I didn't really say that. That wasn't what I really said. And that's when we have to say, really? That's kind of what I heard. Help me with this, if you would. Folks, we do try to avoid arguments. We should. We should all try to get along. But I'm saying this whole thing, to me, was just unfair to Paul. They put Paul in a tough place. My question is, I wonder what those Gentiles were thinking about all this going on. Okay, what were they thinking? And they were just, I, I really believe they were scratching their heads and not really understanding. Verse 25, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no thing except that they should keep themselves offered from idols, from blood, from the strang thing strangled, and from sexual immorality. So they took a little bitty piece of that valve and they did it. My question is for the Jewish people of that days, and if you remember the temple things, they would not even let a, a, a Gentile in their place. Okay, they stayed on the outside. There was a court, all three different kinds of court for women, uh, for men, for the Holy of Holies and all that, but the Gentiles just stood out there. Why? It's our tradition. Let me give you an example. I choose to wear a beard since January the 1st. Why do you care? Why does anyone, and nobody, I'm serious, nobody criticized. Well, I say, one said that's not much of a beard you have. One did say that, all right? And that was my son, by the way, all right? But do you see what I'm saying? I choose to wear a, a tie and a coat today. Does that make me any more Southern Baptist than some other? Southern Baptist. You know, I choose to ride a motorcycle. All right? I'm not going to rob you. I'm not going to beat you up. I've got a headband that I wear. All right? I ride a Harley. <laughs> Am I any different, folks, when I'm on the Harley and when I'm sitting in this pulpit? But yet, you'll sit here and you'll listen. You, some of you have been listening to me for 17 years. 17 years. And all I'm saying is, folks, we've got to quit judging books by covers. Everyone is important to God. Everyone needs salvation. Everyone needs to walk with the Lord and have a church that loves them. And have Christians that love them. And I'm telling you, we treat people the way Jesus treated people. We wouldn't have to worry about them coming back. They will want to come back. And folks, we've got to get this down. All of our churches, I'm not picking on us. People tell me we're a friendly church. And I thank God that we're a friendly church. But we need to go that second mile. We need to make them feel welcome. We need to exchange information with them. We need to tell them 
that we love them and we are glad that they're worshiping with us. And folks, I am telling you, Paul looked over that. And I'm just saying, Paul, I'm just telling you, he is my hero. Jesus Christ is my role model. Paul is my hero when it comes to Bible characters. I'm not so sure I could have done that. And it's the human side of me. I'm not saying I wouldn't. Don't judge me, please. <laughs> I'm simply saying I do not believe the church at Jerusalem treated him the way and had respect for Paul like they should. One last Scripture and I'm done. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 19. Though I am free to all men, I have myself become a servant to all. Folks, that's what we are. We are servants. That I might win the more. To the Jews, I became a Jew. And I'm just going to go on down there. Those without the law, I more. Those who are weak, I became weak. Go back, go down to verse 22. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Okay? He knows he's not going to have salvations for everyone he talks to. But he has that desire to share the gospel with everyone. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they have on. Now this I do, here it is, for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker of it with you. Let me tell you something, folks. All lives matter to God. Everybody. Everybody needs God. Father, thank You for the day. God, thank You for the Word. God, sometimes we don't get it. I really believe the Jerusalem church didn't get it right. I really believe. And God, I just pray Lord, that we just accept people for who they are. That we will just love people for who they are. That we won't judge them or qualify them or stereotype them or try to put them in our box. God, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know You, God, I pray today would be the day of salvation. God, I pray that uh, they would just feel welcome here. I pray that the Holy Spirit would just, just say, man, go down the aisle. Man, go get saved. Go get saved. And God, I pray, and I, I do believe with all my heart, we will welcome them with open arms. So God, just help us. The easy thing to do is act like a Christian when we're here, Lord. But tomorrow's another issue. Tomorrow we're going out into the world. Tomorrow uh, we're going to be tested. Tomorrow we're going to be persecuted. Tomorrow we're going to be tried and even judged. God, I pray that we would be like Paul. I pray that we would just try to do the right thing. Lord, even sometimes that hurts. Not to do the right thing, but how you are treated when you do the right thing. So God, I pray that we would reach out to everyone. That we would welcome everyone. And God, we give you the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?